The Unshackled Waves, episode 89. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. My New Zealand trip is coming to an end, but there are still plenty happening back home in Australia and around the world. Unshackled contributor Jacob Watts will join me in a moment for our regular review show. Uh, But of course, it's time to look at what is happening in the world right now. The same-sex marriage debate seems to be reaching peak lunacy, uh, with this week a worker being fired because she openly supported the No campaign. We've seen gay conservatives targeted for their advocacy of traditional marriage, and more corporations and sporting bodies are stating their support for same-sex marriage. Uh, the effect of all this is the polls have tightened. Uh, yes, is still ahead, but anything could happen. A right-wing online Facebook vlogger, Avi Yemeni, held a rally in Melbourne on su- uh, Sunday 17th of September on the se- steps of Victoria's Parliament to call for the Andrews government to do something about the crime wave sweeping the state. The rally was called Make Victoria Safe Again. Uh, as is the case in Melbourne, uh, leftists organised a counter-protest calling the rally a fascist and Nazi gathering, even though Yemeni is a Jew and a Zionist who hates Nazis. The Australia-US refugee deal that Donald Trump has made clear he is not a fan of is beginning to be implemented. So far, the US will accept only 54 uh, refugees from Manus and Nauru, uh, but it will likely take tr- another 12 months for them to process. Uh, the government is maintaining its policies of not letting any refugees who come to boat settle in Australia despite the howls of the left. A bill to legalise euthanasia has hit Victoria's Parliament and will be voted on by the end of the year. It has the backing of Premier Daniel Andrews and Health Minister Jill Hennessy. Uh, All attempts to legalise euthanasia have failed in state parliaments, though this current bill uh, has a serious chance of getting up. Uh, Based on the overseas experience, uh, many people have a lot to fear from the introduction of euthanasia. Donald Trump unveiled his foreign policy doctrine in his first address to the United Nations General Assembly on Tuesday. It is called Principled Realism, which encompasses his America First pledge uh, that his foreign policy would work to protect the sovereignty of the people of the United States, but it would also work to protect the sovereignty of people from other nations. It is not a completely isolationist or non-interventionist doctrine, but it does indicate all foreign policy measures will have uh, US interests at home and abroad at their heart. Meanwhile, we saw some fake news emerge about the Trump administration, that it was softening its stance on withdrawing from the Paris Climate Accord. The White House came out the next day and said they were still committed to uh, withdrawing from the accord. Uh, This fake news was seized upon by Trump critics who claimed he was never going to follow through on his promises. Uh, But all this shows is that, uh, once again, how malicious the mainstream media is with their misreporting on the Trump presidency. A week after the London Tube terror attack, and lo and behold, the bombers were a pair of refugees, one from Iraq and one from Syria. Another reminder that yes, there is a link between refugees and terrorism, and the United Kingdom's problem with Islamism and terrorism is not going away anytime soon. Also in the UK, uh, they are moving even further to a police state with the Electoral Commission uh, recommending that social media trolls uh, be banned from voting. This basically means that if you hurt a politician's feelings, they can strip away your voting rights. This is a chilling attack on free speech, and if these politicians can't handle some mean words on the internet, then maybe they should find another occupation. This is the Unshackled Waves Review Show. Jacob, welcome back to the show. Yeah, good day, Tim. It's uh, great to be back for another week. Yep, and uh, of course, well, I'm glad that I'm not in Australia at the moment because I'm avoiding this uh, same-sex marriage plebiscite madness that's been uh, going on again in, in the past week. It, it, it's just gotten worse. Can can you fill us in what's been happening? Um, well, the AFL has uh, put a sign up over the top of the AFL logo with the yes, uh, and there has been a bomb threat to the AFL. 
uh, amongst a string of things attacking religious liberty and uh, free speech. Yeah, and uh, it's, it took a really, oh, I'd say, chilling turn this week when it, when it would seem that a, a woman was fired because she was an active no campaigner for same-sex marriage. Yeah, well, well that, that was a shock. Um, the, her boss uh, let her go uh, simply because she didn't like her beliefs. She said that they didn't align with her moral compass. Uh, she said, thanks for your service, and then she was let go. So that's just a sign that uh, people's religious beliefs won't be respected if and when this vote for the Yes campaign goes through. Well, there is a question whether that's actually uh, legal. I know that there's uh, the Fair Work Commission's being asked to to look at it, but there's there's laws to protect people's uh, you know, religious beliefs. But e even so, I mean, uh, you know, just because you you know differ from you know, your your employer on a on a certain uh, issue, that that should be no reason for for them to lose their job. And it was really, I thought, sick the way that uh, this employer she plastered it all over social media saying, you know, I, you know, fired the firm because of, you know, these, you know, horrible views and this is on par with being a racist. And, it, and it's like, if she wanted to, you know, damage the, the no campaign, I'm oh, sorry, damage the yes campaign uh, really uh, badly and prove all of the no campaign's points, then the, she did exactly that. Yes, well, the, the text message itself that, um, that Madeline was sent was damning. Um, basically, unfortunately, I've seen a profile photo of yours, which has really bothered me. Homophobic views being made public are detrimental to my business and don't align with my personal values or morals as an owner of the business. So um, she says, and then she also says that she believes in equality for everyone, but she obviously doesn't believe equally. Uh, in people's opinions and uh, religious convictions. And uh, it's also uh, worth asking the question because, you know, there's all these major corporations who are backing same-sex marriage. In fact, I was just on the Coalition for Marriage website today. There's not one single corporation backing the no case. But imagine if you're a, uh, a worker, at, you know, say Qantas or, or Telstra, like, yeah, how, how, you 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 wouldn't feel free to you know if if you wanted to you could obviously vote no because it's it's confidential the the voting form but if you wanted to you know basically put put your face called publicly that you believe in traditional marriage uh, you know would that get you into trouble with your employer? Yes, well, it it just goes to show that only one uh, set of opinions or or one thought on this issue is publicly acceptable. Now, John Howard and Tony Abbott have brought, brought some good uh, opinions into this matter this week. Uh, Abbott said that uh, liberty shouldn't be an afterthought and, um, and, and, and Howard has uh, spoke with uh, Malcolm Turnbull about uh, the lack thereof of religious protections uh, in this piece of legislation. Uh, there's also more issues with it, the, how ambiguous it's written between two people. So that further goes to show that uh, men, women, that, that those classical definitions will be rendered useless and we'll start to see the, the 230-something gender types recognised. Um, so there's a lot of problems, especially with religious liberty and Howard and, and Abbott have been strong on that this week. Um, and even Bill Shorten has come out uh, and said that uh, no one should be sacked for their religious convictions. So it seems that um, that even Bill Shorten's right on this one. Well, I think the reason why they uh, we're we're going into this plebiscite we, without a bill is because uh, I would assume Malcolm Turnbull wants to avoid the mistake that he made with the Republican referendum, which is putting out. Uh, a specific change 
uh, which not everyone who was for the Republic agreed with and split the vote. So this is why in this plebiscite they're asking the general question, do you think the law should be changed to allow same-sex couples to marry? And they're working out the, the finer you know, details, uh, religious protections afterwards, and they say that basically the Turnbull government is not going to have any input on that. They've just said it's going to be a private member's bill. I think that that's negligent, and it just shows that um, Turnbull's more interested in being politically expedient rather than actually taking into account the serious issues that are here. And they are the threat to, threat to free speech and the threat to religious liberty. He's more interested in having a win, having something uh, to his name, to his legacy, rather than actually doing the right thing by the Australian people. I do try to look at this issue as just narrowly, like, you know, should same-sex marriage be, be legalised? Uh, but a lot of people are trying to, to make the point that it's, it's not just about this simple change in law. I mean, will because, you know, marriage has a new uh, definition now, will, will, be, will we be all be asked to adhere, adhere to it? Would, you know, people who, you know, have traditional marriage views, will they be taken to anti-discrimination tribunals because a, a complainant will say, you know, what you're saying, that's not the definition of marriage. You're, you know, denying what's the law. Yes, well, and then they'll go into these farcical kind of comparisons saying it's like uh, the Jim Crow South and whatever. Um, but we have seen people being taken to anti-discrimination commissions. Uh, the the Archbishop, uh, Catholic Archbishop of Tasmania um, sent out a rather benign pamphlet that said, don't mess with marriage. He was taken to the Anti-Discrimination Commission uh, in, or League in Tasmania by a gay lobby. Um, and also the Swedish Prime Minister sees that uh, proper marriage equality will only uh, come uh, when their uh, religious leaders are compelled uh, to to marry homosexual people. And likewise, a similar thing's happening in Britain. So there is some global precedent uh, to those worries as well. We need to take those into account. Well, the way that anti-discrimination law has uh, worked in Australia, now obviously as a libertarian I have major problem with anti-discrimination legislation, period, but it's always been that anti-discrimination legislation has had religious exemptions. So, for example, uh, you know, Catholic schools, they don't have to employ, you know, gay teachers, for example. So, so that uh, prote protection is, is there. And with the, the legislation that we've seen so far for the um, same-sex marriage, which is Dean Smith's private member's bill, that uh, allows for uh, ministers to uh, refuse. But it, it seems to be that the way the laws are going to be enacted is that you can only refuse if you're specifically a religious organisation. For example, if you just run the, you know, the florist at the at the lo local shopping mall, and that's a business, you won't be covered by, uh, you know, religious protections because you're classified as running a business, not a religious organisation. And that's a problem with there. Uh, is what you've just mentioned. Um, you shouldn't, as a private business owner, be compelled to serve people, um, serve gay weddings if that's not what you want to do, um, if that goes against your religious convictions. And I'm sure that if you were a florist or a baker, um, that might lose a little bit of business for you, but I'm sure that there's thousands of other businesses that uh, gay people can turn to if they want to get their flowers or their cakes for their wedding from a certain place. And I don't think that, I think there's in a few cases in America where they've just found, you know, a conservative business owner and they've tried to uh, just basically have a red herring with them. Um, really no interest in, in getting whatever they wanted. They weren't really offended. They just wanted to take someone down for their own kind of uh, political and um, motives. 
Yeah, make an example of them. Exactly right. Well, I, I hope that because I'm still predicting that the, the plebiscite will be yes. I think it will be much closer than the polls predict. The polls have already tightened, but I still think the yes will get up. But uh, I hope that if that happens, we can take the lessons of, you know, what's happened in, you know, other countries that, that you mentioned before, people being hauled before these tribunals and hopefully, uh, you know, as a, as a nation learn those lessons and to make sure that we can balance the, you know, freedom of, you know, gay people who get married and also, you know, religious freedom and, and free speech. Most certainly. The, 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 whole, the whole issue is, is balancing act. It's, well, not, not, not meaning to delve into another rabbit hole, but say, save schools. It's good to make sure that people aren't being bullied to the point where they want to kill themselves, but it's not good um, going any further than that. So I think that with anything, it's a fine balancing act. And I think with this debate, we need to um, get the measure of liberty and equality right before we go forward. Now, last week we saw yet another terror attack in the United Kingdom, again in uh, London, at an explosion at a uh, London tube station, which uh, injured uh, 29. But thankfully, there were there were no fatalities. But it was certainly another reminder that the Islamist problem in the the UK is not going away. Yeah, for sure. These um, thugs, these losers, these cowards, targeted the school run. Uh, 29 people are injured, uh, and then there's a whole argument about Donald Trump's tweets, which just shows where people's heads are. They're looking to hijack this um, sad event for their own political experience. Yeah, the media will have a go at Trump for anything. I mean, we talked about a few weeks back now uh, how the media we, you know, were criticising his response to the, the hurricanes, and uh, basically when you looked at, at the facts his administration was doing an exemplary job. So the media is just looking at something to pick at there with his tweets. He's exactly right, though. I mean, you know, these people, you know, were losers, and that's another reminder that, you know, the UK is, is still under siege. Well, the points that he's made, uh, I agree with the, the sentiment of them, but I, I don't think that, it, and as Theresa May said, it's... Um, not he healthy to speculate on such issues. Um, and the thing that was a problem was that his tweet as such, which was another attack in London by, by a loser terrorist. These are sick, demented people uh, who are in the sights of Scotland Yard, M must be proactive. Now, the issue here is that he could have given away some classified information. Um, that they were in the, the eyes of Scotland Yard. Um, and Theresa May has already made this uh, point to Donald Trump that, you know, it is a real worry if you have a world leader leaking information like that. Um, but but how, how, the whole, um, how the whole conversation, how that whole tweet went down a rabbit hole to simply attack Trump was quite disgusting. Um, uh, what one person on Twitter labelled it this, it was clear before that Trump relies on Islamophobia to gain support for his policies, but this morning London's uh, tweet confirms that. So simply trying to, to harness this horrible terrorist attack to attack Trump um, is wrong. Um, and, and further, Charles Clymer goes on to say, my apologies on Twitter. My apologies go to the people of London for the embarrassment the Oval Office hijacking this strategy for their hateful agenda. Now, the ironic thing is that he was hijacking this strategy uh, for his own political agenda. And it's interesting when, you know, we... You know, we on the right, we obviously see, you know, these you know, terror attacks. It's not, it's not just one. There's been a series in, in the UK now. And, you know, it's clear just looking at the, 
the evidence that you know our our response is needed, and you know we you and me obviously have disagreements about what is you know the 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 right solution the solution. But apparently, you know we're exploiting a tragedy when we do that. But it's interesting after the the Finsbury uh, pa uh, Park uh, Mosque revenge terror attack uh, that the left had no qualms about saying you know is Islamophobia is you know e everywhere, and you know look look what's happened, and we need a you know anti Islam Islamophobia police task force. Yeah, but the Islamophobia um, is created um, from actions and, and not just a hatred for people. If you have been attacked, uh, as Londoners have been uh, twice at London Bridge, uh, one Finsbury Park attack, of course, and then the Grande concert where 20 girls were were mowed down by a homemade IED with nails, bolts, uh, all that. Of course, there's going to be some uh, residual hatred and resentment for those kind of activities. So, I think that a task force into Islamophobia is just a it's just a, a virtue signal, and it isn't really necessary. If there wasn't terrorism, and this terrorism stems from the doctrines of Islam, if there wasn't terrorism then there wouldn't be any Islamophobia. Um, there, there was no Islamophobia in Australia or anywhere in Europe, I would say, to any meaningful level before they started blowing up the Twin Towers, before they started blowing up schools, hospitals, mosques. Um, there was none of this. Yeah, Islamophobia relies, the, the concept of it relies on what I call the thin air argument. Like, they, they think that, you know, we just got up a, out of bed one day and thought, you know what I really want to do, you know, just hate on Muslims for, for no good reason. Like, no, it's, you know, somebody like me uh, who's, you know, my age, like, you know, I've grown up in, you know, the, the war on terror and, uh, you know, through ISIS, I've seen, you know, attack after attack. I've seen the Islamification of, you know, Western countries and, you know, it's not good. I have, you know, I have reason to, to you know, fear this and, and worry about, you know, the security and also the, the freedom of the, of the West. Um, and the price of, I can't remember who's... Uh, to say this exactly, but the price of freedom is eternal vigilance, and uh, if we aren't to be vigilant, uh, then we are to lose our, our freedoms, and we really need to keep a close eye on these loser thugs. Well, it had been, it hadn't been in the news, they hadn't been an attack in uh, United Kingdom for, for a number of months now, so they, I think that the political leaders, they're always hoping that this that the previous attack will will be the last, but of course it wasn't. We've had this attack, and I'm sure we'll have uh, another attack in the in the f near future. And you know, just you know, wishing and hoping that this problem is going to go away. That's uh, that, that's not a way to make public policy. The, the difficult question here is, uh, how do we deal with it? Now, I do believe in the the merit based. Um, immigration system, um, getting people here based on their merits and not excluding them on the basis of their religion. Now, I don't believe that we can actually do that legally, constitutionally. Uh, under 100, 116 of our constitution, section 116, but we definitely need to look at, say, uh, decentralising uh, where people are staying. It seems that he, places like uh, uh, Fairfield in Sydney, there's a massive uh, over-concentration of refugees and they form uh, ghettos as such. And I think that this is unhealthy and counterproductive and this leads to people becoming radicalised. The, the, the certain element of poverty that's created there, that's certainly not an excuse for their actions, but I'm saying that's a precipitating cause, uh, is not handling the immigration properly. Uh, not evenly distributing the immigration, having them all in one spot, having immigration hotspots, I think that that's dangerous, counterproductive, and it leads to terrorism. Well, certainly, I, I think that the, you know, policies of basically, you know, appeasement and, you know, n not having the expectation that, uh, you know, immigrants should, you know, as assimilate and, 
of, you know, not, to, you know, but make steps to integrate into, in this case, uh, English culture, the fact that, you know, governments still have, you know, colonial white guild and so they're prepared to, you know, tolerate, uh, you know, migrants who play up, for example, with the... Uh, <clears throat> child sex rings that have occurred in towns like uh, Rotherham. There's been there's there's been a lot of uh, I wouldn't say enabling, but but just but just sort of turning a turning a blind eye, sort of saying, well, you know, who are we to judge? It is it is a problem for sure. And you mentioned what Rotherham. That was one of the most disgusting things that ever happened and the police in Rotherham didn't want to report the incidents that occurred there because they were scared that they would be branded as racist. Now, over 2,000 um, girls have been assaulted by uh, Pakistani grooming gangs there um, simply because people were too scared to speak out to be deemed racist. But um, I think that we have to acknowledge that there are some significant concerns with those communities in regards to grooming, domestic violence, terrorism and just crime rates in general. Uh, if you look at uh, the Muslim jail population in Britain, it's quite outstanding. Um, so we need to take all these things into consideration. We obviously need to judge people on the individual merits, but at the end of the day we can see some statistical anomalies forming here that can tell us that this mass Muslim immigration has been detrimental to the fabric of British society. Uh, Donald Trump uh, made his first uh, major speech to the United Nations uh, General Assembly this uh, past Tuesday, where he unveiled his doctrine of uh, principled realism, which is will be probably also known as the, the Trump Doctrine. Each US president uh, has a foreign policy uh, doctrine. And so during uh, Trump's speech, he, he reaffirmed his America first uh, commitment that the uh, sovereignty and protection of the American people would be uh, the primary purpose of his foreign policy, but he still wanted to make sure that there was security in the in the wider world to uh, protect the American people, but also make sure that uh, other nations weren't weren't being uh, trampled on by, as he, he termed, rogue states. Well, for sure, I think he's turned away from what the base wanted, which was the the Ron Paul, you know, if it's uh, not if it's it's their problem, not our problem, kind of look on on foreign policy. But I think that he's turned away from that to say that he is the leader of the free world. You know, America is you know the shining city on top of the hill, and we have to say that you know the the socialist regimes in Venezuela. North Korea are oppressing their people. The people are starving. Um, calling the Venezuelan uh, leader a dictator, having shots at uh, uh, Iran, especially very coming out very strong against Iran and coming against strong against anyone uh, who uh, was willing to support the North Korea, Korean regime and and therefore. Uh, really going after China, uh, China propping up North Korea and uh, I guess as well by default Russia. Um, so he, he come out strong um, and it, it raises the question, is the age of appeasement over? I, I would disagree that his foreign policy during the, the campaign was, you know, uh, Ron Paul style. I mean, he was never a, you know, uh, isolationist or non-intervention. I mean, he still wanted to, you know, make sure that, you know, ISIS, like his uh, phrase, you know, during a campaign speech, I remember was that he wanted to bomb the shit out of them. He. Uh, what he re mainly rejected was the the concept of you know nation building and you know spreading democracy that that uh, had primarily been started by um, George W. Bush with Afghanistan and then uh, Iraq and obviously continued by Obama with uh, what happened in in Libya and uh, also uh, what Obama uh, enabled in in Syria. Well, I believe that he was talking about um, giving um, 
the Venezuelans, you know, is a democracy back again. He spoke out against the dictatorship there. So that urged me as to be the George Bush, Barack Obama nation building that he did campaign against. So I do think that um, dealing with the, the Middle East and nation building in, in that region is different from uh, North Korea and uh, Venezuela. I think in those two countries, the, the people basically just just want some food. I mean, they're 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 not fanatics. Uh, you know, they're you know, f most of them are not you know hardcore uh, you know Stalinists. They're you know they're just wanting to you know make sure they can you know provide for their family and they've got you know an economic uh, situation that is stable. Um, yeah, and, and the inflation of um, the dollar there is extraordinary. There's bread lines, there's nothing in supermarkets. Uh, the petrol price is extraordinarily high, and considering that Venezuela is the primary producer of oil in the world, it just goes to show that the that the, it's, it wasn't the the implementation of socialism gone wrong, as Trump said. It was just the implementation of socialism. So I think that that's really good how Trump came out against that and and basically said that socialism leads to starvation, hyperinflation and death. And I think that that was very good how Trump came up against that. And he, he definitely does see some kind of big brother role in America, uh, the United States in the Americas, making sure that liberty is safeguarded. I think that's why he decided to call it principle of realism. And I think you know, they emphasize the word realism that uh, the U.S. can't do everything and, you know, shouldn't do everything because, you know, first and foremost, it's got to look after the U.S. citizens. And certainly if their um, troops are you know, dying in these you know, for, uh, foreign wars and the, the, bu the budget's blowing out by billions and in some cases trillions, that's... Uh, not in the, the U.S. interest, but uh, obviously a, a stable, you know, world is is something that the U.S. needs because, you know, they're, they're connected with so many other places through trade. And, and he, yes, he, he, he come out against China as well, uh, came out against China saying that, uh, talking about their aggressive expansion in the South China Sea as well, and I think that it is within the United States' interest to safeguard um, sea lanes there because that would be rather detrimental to global commerce if China had complete control of the sea lanes through the South China Sea. Dub the South China Sea goes all the way down to places like uh, Brunei, which uh, shares a border with Malaysia. So we're not talking just about the south of China here. We're talking about nearly two thirds of the way down to Australia. And if the Chinese control those sea, line, uh, sea lanes, then it would be all, it would be very hard to conduct, you know, free and fair trade, uh, because it would be under the thumb of the communist regime in China. So I think that Trump rightly spoke out against that. Oh, well, it's well, China's. Uh the dispute in the South China Sea certainly affects uh, Australia as well, and the United States still has treaty obligations to us under the, the ANSES Treaty, so it still is a US concern. And uh, also he mentioned uh, you know, North, North Korea. I, I, can't, I can't quite remember what he called uh, Kim, Kim Jong-un. It was some uh, crass uh, nickname, uh, Rocket Man, that's what it was. Rocket Man. Yeah. So, um, Rocket Man. And, and definitely yes. uh, North Korea, that is a direct threat to the United States when, you know, a, a regime says that, you know, we're, we're capable and willing to hit, you know, one of your territories. I mean, that is a threat to your national security. Yeah, for sure. But I, I definitely think it was a very Trumpian speech uh, in the sense that um, the, the term rocket man was used. Now, uh, Rocket Man was a, a smash hit uh, from Elton John, and I just think that you know Trump, being a very very serious and well put together world leader, um, it was great that he used that reference. Um, and the funny thing is that the North Korean uh, a diplomat actually left during Trump's speech, and to quote Elton John's song here, well he or she 
pack my bags last night, pre-flight, zero hour, 9 a.m. Um, so the North Korean dicta uh, dictator's uh, diplomat left. Uh, definitely heard the uh, the soft and soothing lyrics of Elton John in the back of his head and thought that I need to make a key and strategic diplomatic move. That was done. Um, but, but definitely it was great to see him coming strong against, uh, as Bush called, uh, the axis of evil. And uh, I made sure that I've looked at the speech, you know, uh, the, the text of the speech. I, I hardly paid attention to any of the, the media commentary, which was, of course was, oh, you know, this was some, you know, unhinged, you know, speech where he was ranting and raving everywhere and it's, God, you know. So I, I'm glad that, you know, we live in an age now where we can see the, the, these things for ourselves and we don't need to get it through the prism of the, the six o'clock news. Yeah, well, for sure, and and I certainly do think that that was a well put together speech. Um, one issue that some did have on the media is that he said that he would completely destroy North Korea. Now, I think that that's fair. Uh, if they launch uh, an attack, a preemptive attack, I think that the U.S. under treaty obligations definitely does have a a right to completely destroy North Korea. Um, and I don't think that that was, uh, you know, a crass statement as the media makes it out to be. But certainly, I think it's a it's a good and solid change from what Obama said in his last address to the United Nations. You know, he was basically I think he apologised for the United States' role on the global stage twelve times. And I certainly do think that um, that that Trump uh, promises and pledges to safeguard liberty are a lot better. Uh, and a lot better for the world than um, meaningless platitudes and virtue signalling. Now, our home state of Victoria is uh, set to debate euthanasia uh, legislation and vote on it before the the end of the year. Now, uh, this legislation was brought about uh, from a parliamentary inquiry and has the support of uh, Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews and the Health Minister Jill Hennessy. Now, uh, euthanasia legislation has been proposed in various state parliaments over the past 20 years. It's been rejected any time, but because it has both the uh, you know, the Premier and the, the Health Minister uh, behind it, there's a real chance that, that, that it could pass. And uh, many people are, you know, are looking at this issue more, more closely now and looking at the, the consequences. Uh, yeah, well, the whole thing's rather disgusting. Uh, the whole mantra in Victoria, this whole pro-death mantra that exists is rather disgusting. Uh, we we see in front of uh, abortion clinics and exclusion zone, uh, it's legal to, to murder a fetus or a baby up until birth. Uh, now we're seeing this, basically this heartless culture uh, immigrating into, uh, into the immigrate, uh, sorry, uh, euthanasia, the final stage of someone's life, it's easier to kill someone rather than to take care of someone. And it's we've seen uh, great advancements in palliative care, um, looking after people in their final stages of life. And I certainly uh, do think that uh, this is tragic because it can reshape the very nature of one's uh, relationship with the doctor. A doctor's meant to be there to keep someone uh, alive, to keep someone healthy, and I think that uh, putting a further, uh, how do you say, um, further, you know, further in, uh, further some, you know, some further the doctor's uh, purview into into being able to end someone's life is a dangerous thing. Uh, it goes against the the oath that the doctors have to take as well. It will change the very nature of the medical field. It lacks compassion. Um, and this whole dying with dignity push, uh, there are so many loopholes, uh, so many problems within it. Uh, we can look to uh, the Netherlands and uh, some states of the United States. Uh, they said at the start of these programs that, you know, it would only be a select few. And now you see thousands of people a year uh, 
taking this choice uh, rather you know than getting the appropriate palliative care that, that they are entitled to so it's a very dangerous can of worms that that will be opened here uh, if the Andrews government is to pass this pro-death legislation and that's an important point that you raise the fact that you know the 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 doctors and you know the Australian Medical Association which is you know has a reputation for being you know pretty leftist they've you know stated their opposition to it that it's uh, against our oath, and it is going to, you know, they say that, you know, this is to, you know, end, you know, suffering, but it, it does create a, you know, as the as the term goes, culture of death. I mean, it puts pressure on, you know, elderly people, you know, the, that, you know, they don't want to be a burden anymore, and, and it also opens up, you know, who's eligible to, for euthanasia. We've seen overseas people, um, you know, with mental health conditions receive euthanasia. Now this legislation, they've tried to uh, placate these fears by saying it's only available for people with, uh, you know, terminal illnesses. But, um, you know, of course, you know, is, can you, can you actually c control this once it's, you know, you say that euthanasia, this is legal. Can you really you know, uh, regulate, you know, all of it? No, obviously there's a slippery slope that's going to occur here. Um, there's some, I can't remember the exact state in America, I think it might be uh, Massachusetts, they might have legalised it, and the same with Holland. Um, and in Holland they have mobile units of death that actually drive uh, to people's homes to kill them. Uh, with their permission. Now you have seen, you know, great uh, spikes. Uh, it started off with only a few hundred people each year. I think in Holland now it's in excess of two and a half thousand people that do this. Um, we shouldn't. It's essentially, it is suicide um, if if someone's doing it themselves, and if someone's having mental issues or or is suffering, we shouldn't be encouraging suicide. And if a if a physician's doing this, it is murder. They're, they're artificially ending someone's life. It's far different from turning off life support. And um, we should definitely encourage um, care and compassion rather than, you know, uh, a pro-death culture. And, and I think the reason why it's also likely, uh, could, could possibly pass is because as, as you mentioned before, we saw the exclusion zones uh, around abortion clinics that was enacted in the, the same term of Parliament. So on paper, there would be the, the numbers there. And I'd say it's a conscience vote uh, for, for both the, the ma major parties. But it's, if, if this goes through, then I, I predict that there could be a domino effect in in other states, uh, so you know, Victor, see, Victoria has done it. Uh, why don't we do it in, in our, our state? And uh, I know that they've also tried to uh, placate the the fears of, as it's called, suicide tourism, uh, saying that only Victorian residents will have access to it. So nobody will be able to come acro across the border to, to euthanise themselves. Um, there was a narrow uh, defeat of euthanasia legislation in South Australia's parliament recently, which it looked like it was going to pass, but uh, thankfully was defeated thanks to some a very good uh, lobbying by Paul Russell, who runs uh, Hope Preventing Euthanasia, which is based in South Australia. He's a he's a very good um, lobbyist, and uh, I certainly hope, and I think he knows, you know, what, what's at stake here. And the the um, anti euthanasia activists have been very active in, you know, putting putting the facts forward. You know, this is you know what euthanasia will lead to, and you know, ma making sure that the MP is aware that you know a lot of people have a problem with this. Well, talking of exclusion zones, now what will happen? Uh, I've, I've read quite a bit about this, what Hennessy has to say about it, so on and so forth, that there'll have to be approvals from doctors and psychologists and that's all grand. But what if uh, people who are saying you shouldn't do this, you'll regret it, you can't go back. What if those people are banned, such as they are with the exclusion zones, 
they're banned from actually convincing people that death isn't the best option. So that's just a further example of maybe how the slippery slope will evolve uh, into creating a, a further culture of, of death. And I know that people criticise the you know slippery slope argument, but we've seen it you know with abortion where uh, it's you know, in Victoria it's up until birth and it has those you know two doctors have got to sign off on it, but it's basically a, for a formality. I mean, uh, you, you can easily get you know two doctors to to do it, and uh, you know we we see it every every week. Uh, you know, ab uh, abortions of um, perfectly healthy, you know, babies. And, you know, this is what will happen with euthanasia as well. You know, we will see, you know, people who, you know, they could be diagnosed with a, you know, terminal illness. They might think they're going to die, but often in these cases, it turns out not to be terminal and they could be, you know, ending their life when they, you know, actually could, could have lived, you know, five, ten years, maybe even 20 years longer. And, and that same issue runs into the abortion argument is that, oh, the kid has Down syndrome, you know, let's terminate. What about, if they say, if there's a 50% chance they, and that the, the, that is the case, but then there might also be a 50% chance that that isn't the case. Then you're ending the life of, of someone who's, you know, perfectly healthy and, and could potentially find the cure to such a disease, which would be the irony now. Uh, you, I would suggest to, to everyone here to watch a film uh, called The Last Cab Drive to Darwin. Now, that uh, explores the story of a, a lonely and hopeless man who had terminal uh, bowel cancer and actually, you know, found some love and some solace at the end of his life. And uh, that was a rather comforting, comforting thing for him. Uh, now, I would yeah, suggest any of you or listener of the podcast to check that out. Because uh, that that is in itself a case in point study, uh, I believe, uh, against um, you know the right to uh, a dignified death, as the the, the pro death people call it. Well, certainly a, a debate will be, or a vote will be watching with uh, you know great uh, great concern. So hopefully that life does uh, prevail. But uh, that's all we've got time for this week. So thank you once again, uh, Jacob, for, for joining me. Yeah, no worries, Tim. It's uh, great to be on the show. Uh, please share uh, this uh, podcast with all your mates and uh, don't forget to uh, uh, let them know about the great work that we're doing here at The Unshackled. And I'll be back in Melbourne uh, ne uh, next week, so we'll be back in the same city. We should try and uh, find, find a time to catch up in person again. Yeah, for sure, Tim. Uh, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of distance here and uh, definitely one-on-one -on -one chat, you know, uh, breaks down some uh, barriers there and there's, there's nothing like that. Definitely get the team together. Uh, regroup and uh, talk how we're moving forward would be great. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. Don't forget our special New Zealand election night live stream with Right Minds New Zealand, which will commence at 5 pm Australian Eastern Time, which is 7 pm New Zealand Time when the polls close. Don't forget the Unshackled is sponsoring the first ever Liberty Fest in Brisbane on Saturday the 14th of October 2017, hosted by our friends at Liberty Works. You can get a 20% discount on tickets by visiting libertyfest.org.au using the coupon code LFUNSHACK, all caps. Thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.